Hello, I'm Morse Kohansky, Wilderness Living Skills and Survival Instructor, generally specializing in the boreal forest. I have uh, had a very busy career in direct in instruction and direct verification of many things that end up in survival manuals, and now in my old age I'm putting pen to paper and uh, making uh, stuff more available through Karamat uh, in the way of videos, DVDs, and some written material. Now, there has been the odd person who is curious to find out what's different between us and others in this same field. Well, what I find is that in this part of Canada where I live, we are kind of few and far between. You don't find too many survival instructors that have made a living exclusively from this type of vocation. And over time, we have developed unique perspective on certain things. And generally, the student wishing to take courses might find it useful to know what that is. And generally, I title this sort of knowledge is that in my experience it's only found in connection with the work I do. The super shelter as, uh, as its use in survival uh, kit as a survival kit component as you may realize that the shelters are considered the second line of defense after clothing. Clothing is the first line of defense. In the shelter in general there are many complex physics that is involved with shelter construction. And when I became involved in, in this issue, I became intrigued with the igloo, or the Inuit snow house, as it should really be called. And I came to realize that if I could try to imitate the features found in an igloo built out of snow, but using, using non-snow materials, but using similar principles of reflectivity, uh, the fact that um, uh, warm air is buoyant and rises, uh, and so on, and that resulted in a shelter called the super shelter. In reality, the super shelter is a marriage between an igloo and a greenhouse. You can find lots of good literature on greenhouse function and construction, and in some ways the super shelter acts like a greenhouse and under certain conditions it uses more of the features of the igloo so that you can get more benefit from the shelter when it comes to cold. The deluxe bow bed. Uh, bow beds are not uh, treated with very much detail generally but I figure that since you may spend a third of your existence sleeping and when you're injured, you need to be able to lay comfortably. And then I figured that the bow bed should be worked on and refined. The general deluxe bow bed is, <coughs> excuse me, is a, uh, 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 probably something I've developed further than anything else. We call it the deluxe bed because generally we... Uh, approach many challenges uh, at three levels. The basic, the standard, and the deluxe. Basic means something as simple as it can get, get, and when conditions are pretty benign, you use something simple and quickly put together. But when it comes to training, there's a certain level of expectation that you want to get out of a bed. So if you take a, a half hour or less to build a bed, you should be that much more comfortable. But if you know you're going to be spending many days using the same bed, or perhaps you're confronted with an injured person that you have to pay more attention to their comfort, then the bed has to be deluxe. So for want of better words to describe it, we find that uh, uh, we, uh, we, we, we break things down into three levels. For example, you could build a signal fire that might take minutes to get the material together to give a, 
a functional smoke or we might build a standard fire that we know we can achieve it if we have the time and then we build the deluxe which is something in a very unusual circumstance where we're in a deep forest in a situation where you a standard one would would may not even be noticed that you've got to know how you evolve or devolve or evolve from the simplest to the most complex because it usually requires more sophisticated knowledge the more complex it gets. You will see a number of things that have the name Roycroft associated with them. The Roycroft snowshoe, the Roycroft pack frame, and the, Roy, the Roycroft scarf, you might say. Uh, Tom, Thomas Roycroft was my guru, still is, because he is still alive. He is 12 years older than I am, which means that he is in his mid-80s. And he is an example of a student-instructor uh, relationship where a good instructor, you can take over and, and continue on where an instructor leaves off, a good instructor leaves off. It's the germ of the idea of the snowshoe built with five sticks and the pack frame built with three sticks and the scarf of, of the dozens of uses came from him. And as I applied and used these things, I found that I could add to it. But I have to give Tom Roycroft full credit for giving me the start and, and uh, establishing a unique way of doing certain things. If you try to build a snowshoe imitating a regular snowshoe, take two sticks, tie the ends together, spread it somewhere, put a crossbar, and then using string try to um, fill in the webbing and so on. You don't really do well using that approach, imitating a regular snowshoe. And Tom realized that if you took small saplings and configured them into kind of a, a cross between a ski and a snowshoe, it was readily done and in many ways was superior to a regular snowshoe. Well, not saying superior to a regular snowshoe, but a properly built snowshoe by someone who knows what they are doing uh, is one thing. At the, uh, the survival snowshoe, or I like to call it the ski shoe, is much more appropriate where you are stuck with the problem of varying what you're going to do. Because when you buy a snowshoe, you pretty well realize you've got one snowshoe for everything. Whereas when you are standing there and you need to build one, you build it according to the conditions you encounter. This year is the first year where we had such a significant crusty snow that it rained so much that the top crust can probably hold you up very well if you had a three-stick snowshoe half the normal length. Whereas normal powdery snow requires snowshoes as tall as you are and as wide as your outstretched hand. But at any rate, you're wasting your time under crusty conditions building a comprehensive snowshoe where you could build a shadow of the real thing and it would function very well because of the conditions. The pack frame was an idea that was brought back from Korea when some soldiers that had served in Korea had seen the farmers carrying produce to market using a frame made out of three sticks in a certain way and Tom took that idea up and created a very functional backpack because sooner or later you're going to have to carry something rather heavy and it's a big advantage to be able to make your your uh, pack frame right on the spot. And Tom introduced me to the jam knot which in my old age, I began to realize that there was no knot in creation that was as useful in general living and survival as the jam knot. And used with paracord, it became one of the most powerful means to lash things together in, in, uh, in, with the least amount of cord, with the most powerful uh, binding that you can achieve, uh, especially with the 550 um, uh, paracord. In my association with Tom, we encountered uh, 
the many shelters that we could augment or produce with, par with parachute fabric. As in the military, parachute fabric is readily available. And it's a specialization that we could write probably a 350-page book just on all the things that you can do with parachute fabric, but in particular uh, used as a material in the construction of more sophisticated shelters. Many years ago, I discovered the flip-flop winch. I had learned the Spanish winch or windlass that was used by some of the people, the, some of the pioneers when traveling by horseback on ice. You can expect that sooner or later you're going to break through the ice and you would have to help that horse get back on the ice. So you always carried an axe and a rope. And as I built the, the, the winch, it was uh, very useful in, in uh, extricating ourselves out of uh, various conditions. And then one day I read up about the Finnish windlass, which was used for bringing logs up to the higher levels in log house construction. And when I looked at that type of winch, and I realized that there was a winch between the Spanish and the Finnish, and I called it the flip-flop winch, which turns out to be uh, 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 a, you know, a combination of the two to produce a very powerful means for one person to be able to create a, a pole using two poles and a non-elastic rope. Now there are many definitions that I tried to clear up with regard to knowledge in, in survival. So defining a survival knife, a survival saw, survival pot, survival kits. <coughs> the de defining the fires useful in survival. Defining survival knowledge itself. Defining the important aspects of clothing in survival. I also feel that the collection of books and articles that I acquired on the art of sharpening was not very well organized. And I've actually had people comment on the fact that my rendition of how to sharpen knives was the clearest that they have ever encountered with regard to you being a learner and wanting to cut to the chase and become skilled at sharpening. The, um, the, I feel that I've been instrumental in the resurrection of various tests, like the test for hypothermic incapacity that I learned from the Cree, uh, the, uh, the test for dehydration by the, the in, uh, hypothermic incapacity is how difficult is it, it is to touch thumb to little finger. And if you're finding great difficulty, you better, better uh, uh, stop and, and warm up because things aren't going to get any better. Um, the other th uh, test that I learned not long ago was the test for dehydration when you take the skin on the back of the hand and pinch it and how quickly it returns to a smooth surface. Uh, the uh, use of the baton that I learned in the Navy uh, by pounding on the back of a knife blade with a, with a fid or a piece of wood to make a cut that virtually almost makes a knife uh, as effective as a hatchet. Uh, reading in an old Boy Scout magazine the use of a stick that you carve various notches on called a tri-stick. And the hook and rope making. All these things I derived from old literature and have resurrected it for the benefit of, of survival. The other thing is that I wrote a book called Northern Bushcraft or bushcraft today, an analysis of the hierarchy of natural primitive shelters. The analysis of the most useful knots in survival, so that I'm sure you can accomplish almost every operation that you need to, to employ uh, uh, using rope and survival in, into seven knots. And I think I might even be the first one to describe the one whole method of bow drilling a fire by friction where you furiously drill into with a new drill tip into a new board at a certain point stop and then push the powder into the hole and like magic the ember begins to glow 
because of the heat radiated from the parabolic shape of the hole. Now these are the, uh, the rough uh, outline of things that I figure you're not going to find anywhere, anywhere else in a so-called modern survival manual. You would have to dig deep and far in the anthropological literature, the pioneering knowledge and, and some of the knowledge that I fell back on that was brought from Poland by my, my parents in, in the issues of, of, of growing up on a farm.